Farsight, on Arthur's Moloch, finds something in the ruins that will change his life and the fate of the Tau Empire, a sword. Where on the planet did he get this sword? What freedom does he gain through it? And why is his life extended afterwards? Friends, let's find out. And welcome to another 40k video. Today we read from and comment on the Codex Supplement Farsight Enclaves, the section that covers Arthas Moloch. At this time, to set the scene for you, ten years have passed, and the Tau have reclaimed the Enclaves from the Orcs, but they still hunt down these invaders and exterminate the Orc menace, taking back world after Orc infested world. One such planet in this situation was Arthas Moloch. During Farsight's pursuit of a fleet of Orc asteroid ships to the world of Atarivo, a number of the strange vessels had split off for distance Arthas Moloch. Sure enough, as Farsight's expedition neared that ancient world, he picked up telltale signs of Orc infestation within the planet's built-up zones. On close inspection by aircast patrols, there was little to no activity upon the planet's surface. The Greenskins had either conquered the indigenous life forms already, or invaded a world that was already dead. On the bridge of his flagship, Farsight's lips peeled back in a grim smile. The Orc would would not lack for company much longer. Arthas Moloch was the latest in a long string of worlds to feel Farsight's wrath. Divided and frequently leadless, the Greenskins were slowly but efficiently taken apart by Farsight's orc killer cadres. However, friends, a strange phenomenon occurred at an eight-pillared temple dubbed the Great Star Days by the Aircast. Clearly, eight pillars could be the eight points of the symbol of chaos. Wherever an arc fell to the dusty stone near this daze, a bizarre explosion of light spilled out. Fartite himself oversaw this part of the purge and had killed dozens of orcs within his own rifle. He watched in fascination as eventually a blazing disc of multicolored lights began to form above the daze, the shadows of the milling orcs beneath it dancing with a life of their own. Perhaps it's feeding what's there. Then a sudden gout of energy poured out of the disc-like, blood bursting from a dying man's lips. When its glow faded, the star-carved stone was covered with horned crimson aliens, the likes of which Farsight had never seen. The long-limbed figures cut into the orcs with swords so black they seemed to Farsight like holes in space, their unintelligible war cries forcing his battlesuit's audio cut out to engage. Now why would his suit have that if he's just hearing voices? Could it be that whoever built the suit, could it be that the rulers of the town perhaps had this built into their suits in case there was some chaos incursion that might affect their forces? It's possible. And then more gobbets of energy spilled out of the blazing disc and dozens of bright pink figures cartwheeled and capered out from wherever they touched. Raising their comically long arms to the skies, they sent blazing streams of multicolored fire into the tower observers above. Farsight's eyes widened as the flames splashed onto the prow of a passing piranha, turning its canopy to shards of kaleidoscopic glass and sending it plowing down into the melee below. More flames gushed out, turning tower to stone, to water, to statues of screaming bone. Now to me, these things happening to the Tau near this chaotic, possibly Xenos artifact, those effects don't feel very chaotic to me, at least not aligned with the usual powers. So perhaps there is a more Xenos origin to this. Anyway, on with the tale, friends. Farsight ordered the retreat, commanding his forces to fall back into the skies as quickly as they could. They acted without hesitation, leaving the surreal nightmare of the Great Star Days behind without a second thought. Oshova, which is Farsight's actual name, himself was the only one to look back as he gazed down into the crackling disc that whirled above the days. The portal gazed back, though he knew that to, to be impossible, growing larger and larger until it filled his vision completely. It seemed to him that some titanic void 
a rip in the fabric of reality of mind-boggling scale had torn the heart out of the galaxy. Within it writhed the trilling terrible deaths, each carrying out their death throes before him, calling out to him by name. In that moment, Oshovar was changed forever. He had beheld a danger far greater than that posed by the races of o- And I've had to look up and find out what the Shiohei was. So if we just go back to that last line, It is pretty obvious, but I had to look it up between takes. So the line went, As blood began to trickle from the Shiohei between his eyes, Oshava lost consciousness. The Shiohei between his eyes is obviously, and I'm pretty dumb for not noticing this, is the nose. Anyway, in the next section, we pick things up with Farsight when he awakens. He found that his unconscious form had been retrieved to the medbay of his flagship. The situation on Arthas Moloch had gone critical. His advisers reported, though there were Tau still planet side, they were preparing to evacuate, such were the forces against them. Drawn by the lure of battle, the orcs were battling in their thousands to the site of the great star days. Fortunately, the orcs were throwing themselves into the fight with the mysterious red-skinned aliens that had appeared there and driving themselves ever closer to extinction in the process. And here we'll just cover a little side note. Within the Codex, there's a little detail about Arthur Smallock, which I think might be worth reading to you to set the scene and give you a feel of what this planet's like. The artifact world of Arthur Smallock is as grey and desolate as a tomb. Its surface is jumbled with thousands of tumble-down shrines and strange, faceless statues that predate any of the worlds of the Imperium. The world's surface is cracked and broken, giving the sense that the planet itself died long ago an impression that is reinforced by the fact that not a single green shoot or patch of moss can be found anywhere on its surface. Not a single living soul makes a home there, though the plaster walls of the planet's tombs bear the dark brown smears of bloodshed and ghostly shadows have been burnt into the walls wherever the ruins cluster close together. Though the world is barren as bone, if one possessed of psychic abilities were to behold it with the second sight. It would shine like a gold mine in firelight. The shrine hold is peppered with artifacts of ancient and mysterious origin, each a priceless wonder left discarded in the dust. So chaos can emerge here. It's emerging from this daze and the planet is pretty devoid of life. So perhaps the forces of chaos devoured those on the planet and the artifacts left behind are what was left by those that lived there, perhaps those that worshipped them maybe, if the artefacts are left at the shrines like as a tribute to the demons. Fun speculation, now on with the video. Though his head felt like it was splitting apart, and every joint and muscle in his aged body was experiencing stabbing pain, Farsight countermanded the orders given in his absence. The Tau would not evacuate, he said. They had somehow caused this strange nightmare to awaken, and it was their duty to end it. The ethereals attached to the council nodded their approval, insisting that they must personally monitor the new threat they had uncovered. The instructions given, the firecast girded itself to return to the great star days in force. Squadron after squadron of orcs in dropships descended into the shattered amphitheatres and mausoleums ranged around the great temple on Moloch. As mantas dropped hunter cadres into the orc infested necropoli of the hinterlands, a large detachment of Tau had been tasked with monitoring the strange creatures spilling from the rift, whilst two other major detachments eradicated the remaining orcs at as extreme a range as possible. The seething melee that had started upon the great days was heaving back and forth as more and more orcs joined the fight, as far sight and the ethereals that had been seconded to his expedition, came within scanner range, a pair of massive red-winged creatures, twice the size of Farsight's battlesuit, burst out from the disc in a blaze of red light, hurtling through the skies directly towards them. Behind them came more winged beasts, some feathered in the manner of violan rocks, some with bat-like wings that drizzled gore on the combatants beneath. These airborne terrors split off into two groups, that had headed out into the wilderness 
As they winged through the skies, they roared and shrieked in a language that Oshova could not even bear to hear, let alone translate. His broadside teams were first to open fire at the winged monstrosities swooping towards them. Heavy rail fire slammed into the ornate breast arm of the leading monstrosity, tearing off a wing and sending it wheeling to the ground. Seeker missiles and plasma bolts were added to the fusillade, and the second beast quickly diverted around an ancient temple lost from sight. Suddenly a third winged creature burst through a crumbling facade to fall upon the fire warriors hiding behind it. The giant alien's brass axe cut several tow in half with every swipe. This time Farsight understood the creature's booming war cry. It was an archaic form of the warrior language used by the Imperium's space marines. Its rumbling voice resounded from the scattered statues and temples of the haunted world. Blood, it screamed as it splashed gore across the alabaster walls. Blood for the blood god. I find it very interesting there that the demon speaks in gothic even when it's hanging out with the Tau. Perhaps because none or not many Tau souls have been taken by the demons so they can't speak the language. I'm not exactly sure how that works but it's an interesting little wrinkle in the details. The second of the giant beasts dropped down from above, its clawed feet kicking Farsight backwards into the plasma ruins of an ancient statue. A shot from Oshovar's plasma rifle caught it under the chin, sending it reeling backwards for a moment before its curling whip lashed out and ripped the arm from his crisis suit. The battlesuit's directional scans picked up a weapon shape behind him, the sword clutched by the statue, his fall had toppled. So the sword that Farsight gets his hands on was held by a statue. Again, my theory that things arranged around this site are tributes to the forces of chaos, the demons there. Think about it. If you mean this power, you don't know where it's from, you don't understand it. I can see how that would easily lead to people wanting to appease it, thus the items left. At least possibly. Farsight darted behind the statue's rubble a split second before the beast's axe smashed the marble figure to powder. The statue's curved blade fell free, rolling sideways, as if it wants Farsight to take it. Farsight snatched the sword up in a smooth motion and swung it hard at the beast's midsection. The creature easily evaded the blow, launching itself up into the air and bounding past his position. As Farsight pursued the beast, he saw it bring its axe down into a nearby fountain with an overhead blow of such power that Oshovar could hear the sharp crack of the flagstones beneath. A moment before Farsight caught up with it, the beast bounded into the skies and swooped off into the distance. Fighting the urge to c continue his pursuit, Commander Oshovar sent the... A great number of the brightly coloured creatures had driven the second battle group back with their strange spectral flames. But for some reason they gave a wide berth to one of the worn down statues east of the days. The tower took the opportunity to regroup under its shadow. Meanwhile, the ethereal that had joined the third battle group, Own Diemen, had been gored to death in an attack by a giant vulture-like creature. Farsight's warriors were in disarray, trapped with orcs on one side and the unidentified alien creatures on the other. The fire warriors were on the brink of panic, for the more they shot the creatures down, the more of them appeared. It was almost as if each kill caused more beasts to replace those that fell. Tapping into the visual feeds of the battle suits in the second group, Farsight examined their environment, looking for some advantage. In the country's midst was a grape-robed statue, a strange hexagramic medallion brandished in its grip. The reference to hexagramic that normally ties to some sort of shield or containment, either to keep chaos in or out. So perhaps there are others that perhaps worshipped the demons on this planet, knew how dangerous they were, and figured out some way to counter them. Something struck Farsight as odd about the symbol. For one thing, when he looked at it, the pain that had flared in his head seemed to subside. Perhaps the whispers of corn there are pushed away. Acting on instinct, Farsight ordered his warriors to retrieve the hexagram from the ancient statue and carry it forward against the flame beasts. A few tense seconds passed before the breathless report came that the multicolored aliens were falling back before it. Owen Diem's leaderless cadre adopted the same tactic. 
after finding a medallion of a similar nature at their own rally point. If there's several of these things, perhaps they were trying to contain the warp portal. Oshovar's mind world, it seemed as though it would take more esoteric means to defeat this new and hard to defeat foe. He took a moment to think on the words that Pure Tide had taught him upon the peak of Mount Kanji all those years ago. To secure victory, the wise must adapt. That's certainly a philosophy that Farsight takes from this point onwards very seriously, making many big decisions that change his life. We'll come to some of that in a moment. Now to the battle. Ordering all three battle groups to converge on his position, Farsight rearranged his battle plan in an instant. The fire warriors and their support teams would engage the orcs, forming a periphery around the great star days that could not be breached under any circumstances. The crisis teams would alone engage these new foes at the crackling disc itself, and the hexagramic medallions would be brought to far sight wherever they were found. Above all, he ordered, no blood must be split on the days. If a battlesuit pilot was hit, he must withdraw immediately. Seeing what had happened to the planet previously, perhaps that informed that decision. Perhaps it was instinct. Perhaps it was because he needed to do it. Who knows? Farsight's warriors were perplexed by their orders, but they carried them out to the letters nonetheless. Oshovar and his battlesuit cadre stormed the Great Star Days as his warriors kept a defensive perimeter so that no more orcs could reach the fight. Flame-armoured crisis teams burned the remaining green skins that still fought upon the days to a crisp, darting out of the reach of the crimson-skinned aliens wherever they came close. As clouds of fire washed across the ground, the blood that covered the flagstones dried and clotted to a crusted film. A howl of dismay sounded from the strange crimson-skinned creatures, reaffirming what Farsight had suspected. The beasts needed blood to survive. A warning echoed across the days from the brave monarch who was the latest to claim the title of Commander Brightsword. He spotted a trio of the massive winged beasts plunging out of the skies. They each had their axes raised as they dove with reckless momentum straight for Farsight himself. Commander Farsight raised his captured blade high in salute before flicking it outward and the hexagonic medallions that hung loosely around its length sailed in a lazy arc towards the crackling disc in the centre of the days. A moment before the winged beast fell upon Oshovar, the medallions passed into the blazing energies. A tremendous backblast boomed out of the portal, knocking the tau into the dust, as they gradually helped each other up out of the rubble. They saw that the skies were clear, and every single one of the rift creatures had disappeared without trace. Whoever put together these hexagonic medallions clearly knew what they were doing. In the wake of the strange battle, Farsight and his warriors purged the ruins of the remaining green skins. No victory shouts were heard, no warrior vows rang out. Instead of celebrating their double victory against the creatures infesting Arthas Moloch, the tower returned to their fleet in silence. The last of the ethereals had been found, headless, surrounded by his unconscious bodyguards. All three ethereals were gone, leaving the tower bereft of guidance. The enclaves had lost all of their spiritual leaders in a single tragic battle. Luckily, they had the heroic Farsight to pick up that slack. Oshavar could not shake the feeling that this had not been an accident, that some unfeasible force was conspiring against his people. Though all of his training and formidable intellect rallied against it, the visions he had seen in that crackling portal stayed with him night and day, infecting his thoughts with ever more dangerous conclusions. There was more to the universe than progress, unity and destiny. Something lurked behind the material world. Something foul, hungry and immeasurably evil. Now just to give you a little information on the sword he has, it's dubbed the Dawnblade. We're told that the mysterious artefact that he take on an Arthas Moloch is even older than the Imperium of Man, fashioned aeons ago by the strange race that once inhabited that haunted world. The Dawnblade has been forged for materials that even the finest of earth cast minds cannot fathom. Its blade is sharp enough to cut through rock, and since taking it up on Arthas Molak and modifying it for use in battle, it has been Farsight's weapon of choice for close engagements. Unbeknownst to Farsight, the ancient sword has a dark secret. Its blade is made from chronophagic alloys. Whenever its wielder cuts a life shot with it, 
the natural span that he stole from his victim is added to the wielder's own. This has allowed Oshovar to live for almost three centuries, though he has his suspicions that it is the Dawnblade that has prolonged his lifespan to such a degree. If Farsad ever found out the horrible truth, he would likely end his own life in ritual suicide right then and there. And with the mention of chronophagic alloys and some of the medallions found, the hexagramic medallions found on this planet, it feels like this is a race that had some sort of technology to combat chaos, the sword being part of that. The lifespan thing, I'm not sure. It sort of makes me think it's a chaos weapon, but chronophagic alloys, it kind of implies that that's built into the sword rather than being some property or magic put there by chaos. And on that, friends, and the Farsight's capture of the Dawnblade will wrap up today's video.